Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast series is proudly brought to you by Russell Investments. With more than 80 years of experience, Russell Investments is a global investment solution partner dedicated to helping investors reach their long-term goals. Russell Investments specialize in multi-asset solutions that combine asset allocation, capital markets insights, factor exposure, manager research, and portfolio implementation. Welcome back to the XY Advisor podcast, where we are in our second episode of our five-part series on ESG, Focused Investing. Uh, today, we're talking about the actual need. Is there an actual need for, for ESG? What is it? And uh, what is it from all angles? And today, of course, I'm joined by Philip Moffat. Welcome, Philip. G'day, Francis. Thank you for joining us. Now, let's uh, let's dive straight into this topic. Uh, what, tell us about this ESG thing, and, and why is there a need for it? Well, if, if you remember from our last episode, we talked about uh, environmental, social and governance as being really a, a shorthand way to measure some of the components of, of sustainability. Um, and sustainability means creating businesses or assets that that have long and productive lives, not just financial lives, but, but also lives that contribute positively to the communities in our environment. I think that the, the core issue is the idea that sustainable businesses trade at a higher valuation or sustainable assets trade at a higher valuation than unsustainable ones. If you think something's going to last for 100 years, you're prepared to pay a higher multiple of earnings on it than if you think it's going to last for 10. That's that's it. That's the guts of it. And so investors forever have been trying to find ways to figure out whether the assets they're investing in are sustainable or not. ESG is just a way of codifying that process and saying, here are some of the measures you might want to look at, and here are some of the measures that the assets and the businesses could produce that help you understand whether they're sustainable or not. And so is it necessary? Yes, it's necessary to try and make good investment decisions. Yes, it's necessary from the assets or the company's perspective to try and attract capital at a at an attractive valuation. And if it's necessary from both sides of the transactions, it's necessary for the market. Now, if we go, if we go back to both sides of this transaction, you mentioned uh, obviously sustainable, uh, amazing um, concept for investors. For consumers, are they looking at sustainability or are they looking at more sort of their own uh, passions, beliefs, emotions at the time, um, what they've heard, what they've what their beliefs are? Oh, look, I, uh, and I think that it potentially there's some confusion in the space, right? So people start talking about ESG or sustainability or impact or being socially aware or triple bottom line, all these kind of things. And it can be conflated between trying to generate an optimal economic outcome, whatever, however you define optimal economic outcome, but define more broadly than financial outcome. Right? So reduce pressures on the environment, better social outcomes and so on, some, some sort of function that gets optimised yep. compared to um, individuals or groups who may have very specific social um, or environmental beliefs. And those social environmental beliefs may line up with the optimal business structure or, or asset structure and they may not. You know, I might really believe that, I don't know, pick something that you shouldn't take a fish out of the ocean You know, and genuinely believe that. And so I'm going to invest in assets that only work to stop any um, fishing in the ocean. Others might think that, you know, there's scope for some fishing, but it needs to be controlled and regulated and need to do other stuff. And so um, dividing those two things, I think, are, are really important. And there will be a group of providers of assets or portfolios who adhere to very strict controls around very specific um, constraints. And they'll, they'll be appropriate for that small group of investors who have kind of a really, really strong belief about an individual topic. ESG, I think, is a much broader idea uh, for the investment market. So one of the things, that, as you mentioned sort of in the first episode, and we, and we sort of touched on it, the idea of trading at a higher multiple, um, the financial logic that came with, um, with the idea of investing in um, ESG funds, and as you mentioned, um, consumers are at that space where they still sort of may believe that the financial logic doesn't stack up or that it's an emotional decision. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think if they genuinely believe that the finances don't stack up, they shouldn't invest. 
it's the manager of the asset or the advisor who's working with the client who needs to be able to make the case and challenge that set of beliefs. If somebody believes something, it's it's all you can do is engage with with the facts and try and persuade. But if you can't change the view, you can't change the view. I do uh, think that uh, increasingly we're going to see. Uh, it, you can see it in the marketplace now that businesses with a lower carbon footprint trade at higher multiples to, to ones with a higher carbon footprint. And we get caught up in the politics, you know, should there be a carbon tax? Shouldn't there be a carbon tax? Should there be a mining tax? You know, should um, uh, we be charging electric vehicles less road tax than um, petrol driven? You know, all this kind of stuff. That's just politics and short-term tax and all that kind of stuff. You've got to put yourself in the long-term uh, seat of an investor who says, look, we mightn't be charging a tax on carbon today, but we will. And we'll either do it directly or we'll do it indirectly because the market will figure out what the implicit costs are. And so as a long-term investor looking at assets, forget about the short-term politics noise and all that rubbish. Try and look beyond to the ultimate uh, necessary outcome. Yep. Um, I, I guess some of my, my thoughts around that is uh, with the with the initial where are we at the on the journey of um, is ESG an emotional decision or is it a financial decision or is it both? Um, where where are we on that journey? Like as in, I, I know you're sort of mentioning the multiples are higher, um, those sorts of things. Is the ESG investing um, space now come to or past any non ESG investment space? I think in parts of the market it has. So. Um, uh, particularly, I think about uh, big pools of capital in Europe, so pension funds, net, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, and stuff. If if you don't have uh, a, a verifiable quality ESG filter on assets you you bring to those organisations, you you don't get through the gate. They're just not even looked at. And increasingly, that's the case here for the, the super funds, and because it's what our members demand, and it will become increasingly the case in other parts of the the investable universe too. And it's not just in the kind of the rich um, Western world. It, it, it's also the case with pools of capital in, you know, for instance, emerging Asia, which insist on these sorts of measures being put in place. Fantastic. Uh, Philip, thank you for coming on and chatting us about this particular topic. I look forward to catching you in the next episode where we tackle the 50 Shades of Green. Welcome back, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. Now, today we're talking about uh, all things to do with uh, ESG. And is there an actual need? And we really wanted to dive into the, the concept of why is ESG an, a thing uh, um, and why is it relevant? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? ESG is a thing which is used by fund managers and analysts to look at the, f- the risk of this investment. So ESG is a metric that's looking at you know, how risky this investment is going to be from a financial point of view um, and from a long-term point of view. Um, it is not what investors and clients generally think of as ESG, which is I'm going to buy this product or invest in it because it fits my value frame. And so a lot of things that are ESG, they mean two different things to the fund manager and the analyst versus the client. But ESG is also a convenient sort of set of measures by which one can start to think about what it is that uh, a, a fund or a company is doing in terms of taking into account the um, environmental risk factors that might impact on its business longer term and whether it's going to be a stayer in the system. Yep. So from a client point of view, if a client, if you're, you're talking to a client, they've come in, you mentioned there's sort of a different thing. They're, they're, they're coming at this from a, you know, a passion or emotion point of view as well as, you know, this is the world that they have to live in and they're bringing their kids up in. Yep. Um, and they want something, they, they want to make sure that their investments aren't creating damage or harm. To start with, is that, is, that, is that the starting point? Their starting point is I have some money and I want to do the right thing with it and I want to make sure that that we can contribute to you know, the planet being green or you know a safer planet for our kids or whatever. And I've heard about ESG and um, then I will usually go through the explanation to them about what ESG actually is and to figure out with that client what 
their value frame is um, and talk to them about that ESG is one way of understanding things and it's limited. Um, yep. And then if they're also more interested in that, then I will sort of go through the metrics behind what ESG actually means um, and how there's no particular um, set framework that measures everything except against um, a certain set of variables and that there's a whole lot of interpretations and misinterpretations about these things. Yep. Um, so it's setting a framework that says this is as much as we can know about anything that's ESG reliably and you need to understand that this is an inexact science. Yeah, it's, fun. it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's obviously there's the emotional decision making factors inside a client's mind, uh, and then there's the financial logic, and as you said before, the science logic uh, involved. So the, the, a couple of different logical things involved. Do you think? Do you think clients are making the decisions on emotion, or are they are they making decisions on the financial and scientific logic? I think that it's a bit of both, and I think that people want to feel good about what they're doing. And what they think that they're doing with their finances is real and it's not f um, fraudulent in any way. And I mean that people, that you know, a fund manager or a company isn't lying about what it's doing. Um, but people are also, um, I think that there's different behaviours that, that people have about investing money and then where they have indirect control in a way of what happens to their money versus their decisions to spend on something that they have identified themselves to be ethical, like, you know, clothing or recycling or whatever. And then some people actually want to donate money and um, they've actually identified, you know, a charity or a good cause or whatever that, that they're willing to support that fits in with their principles. So I think a lot of it is about locus of control um, and uh, investing is where they actually have the least amount of control. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you, uh, indirect control or, or some sort of control um, mm. around how they feel about the outcomes or the, yeah. the feeling good yeah. about the investment. Um, yeah. is, that, is, that the, is that the main reason why you think there is a, a need for ESG investing funds? From the client's point of view? Mm. Yeah. I think that the, the need is there because people want to be doing the, real, uh, the right thing for themselves um, I don't think it's anything that people particularly talk about in uh, their um, communities or groups. People are fairly private about their money. And um, the clients that I've, I've done a, recently done a client survey on things and, and, and my clients never talk to their friends about money. Yeah, that's really interesting too. Is that, um, would they be more likely to talk to their friends about money if they were feeling good about the, the ESG um, part of their portfolio? I think if they were feeling confident about it, they might. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's always been in. Yeah, so feeling good is one thing, but actually feeling confident that, you know, what your funds are actually doing is actually making a difference to whatever. Yep. Yeah. Is 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 different. Yeah. And yep. and I think I think that a lot of the things that people do to, to make themselves feel good about these things is join sort of various activist groups or um where they can actually visually have some sort of impact if they uh, go to sort of shareholders' meetings or whatever where they can actually, they know that their effort has made some sort of impact. It's more demonstrable than investing, which is a longer term, has longer term outcomes anyway. Yep. And what about uh, returns? Is that is that often a, a big part of the equation? Obviously, uh, Sorry, sometimes with, 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 with the returns on investment. Uh... Um, I think that um, the that um, people's re returns are an issue, but only if they're going to be um, not supporting a, a sort of future lifestyle that they're wanting. I, th I don't think that people necessarily want to be able to uh, make. Um, 
stellar returns and I usually tell people that I can't guarantee any returns that anyone's going to make anyway. I think that um, what they're wanting is that there's some level of comfort with the returns that they can make and the um, evidence is in that responsible, whatever that word means, um, responsible investing is um, equ is equivalent in terms of its returns or better than the returns of your average um, international or local fund. Do you, do you think that um, people think that uh, the returns will be less because it is an ESG? I think that they used to, but I don't think they do anymore. Yeah, okay. So times have changed, tides turned. Um, I think time to change, time to turn. And I think that one of the influencing factors of that is the governance part of the ESG is really important. And yep. that companies that manage what they're doing, that look after their staff and that are actually taking uh, the effects of, you know, climate change or, you know, energy issues into account in terms of their business planning do better longer term. So it's good company practice. Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for, for joining us in this episode. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode when we tackle the 50 Shades of Green. Welcome back to this episode, Paul Garner. Thank you very much. Thank you for com thank you for joining us. Now, in this episode, of course, we're talking about the, uh, is there a need for ESG? You know, wh why is ESG a thing? Wh what are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, people realise that they've got this big lump of money sitting in usually superannuation that may be funding things that they don't really feel good about. And uh, that's been a gradual realisation over time. Um, uh, uh, there's been advisors doing this a lot longer than me. So there, there <laughs> was a niche of people who all, all, all generally had this issue, but that is growing over time as people realise that how, how can they influence how what, what's happening in the world? And... Um, and for me, as I, I, I have been and, and still am a social activist in terms of trying to influence the political process, uh, and then I thought, well, personally, I thought, well, there's another way to do this, and that's through the flow of money. Money talks, uh, BS walks. So if you can make the money talk, then that's a way of influencing outside of the political system how things are going in our world. So um, that was a big motivation for me to specialise in that area uh, when setting up my own practice. I thought, if gee, if I could get enough people together to start that influence or, or spread that influence, then that, that could be powerful. And so that was yeah, my it's motivation. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it, that everyone sort of got their story. But uh, the two great, amazing things that you sort of mentioned on there, the fact that your own, you know, the social actor, activism or, or the the idea of you you know trying to make a better world for yourself and your family and your friends and you you know the, those people around you um community and then also realize the realization that the influence large amounts of money can have on businesses and investment and uh and and shareholdings and 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 the difference the difference between um social activism which is you know obviously you spreading the word through media and friends and family and having conversations and the financial activism, I guess you could say, of uh, letting companies mm. know that if they want uh, if they want investment, they need to be looking out, out, you know, getting on the board. So it's kind of like coming at it from two ends, I sort of feel. Yes, personally, that was a, a real issue for me. And I think that's gradually uh, taking up, uh, cottoning on. I, I think the majority of people have no idea where their money's invested, but uh, as as people uh you know as that message gets through then people will stop to think well gee um or i haven't got much money but then they've got this huge lump in superannuation that needs uh attention and yep. it's wonderful also because younger people are now focusing on that lump of money where otherwise they would think oh super who cares you know that's that's something for old age. That's for future. That's for my future self to worry about. But um, now it's promoting them to actually take an interest, which is wonderful. Because as an advisor, you can make such a huge difference in someone's life when they've got the time to uh, fulfil that, rather than seeing them at fifty-five going, "Shit, I'm going to retire in five years. I need to do something." But you give give them thirty years, and wow, what a difference you can make. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it too. I think super funds have for many years were trying to be working out how to engage their members. Uh, and yeah. this is, as you said, a, a brilliant way of um, engaging members who have a longer a longer term and obviously can do something better. Now, I just wanted to touch on the concept. You mentioned this uh, in the first episode around the financial logic um uh, you know, the financial returns of ESG funds now are not just the, you know, the fund that, you know, never used to return as high and you always, people used to chase them, chase the money first. Uh, and you think that pendulum swung? I do. Uh, just from, from that notion of, okay, what's, what's, what's going to be the future industry and, and what are industries that are, that are slowly dying or, or not going to be around or, or are going to have to uh, radically change to cope with what our futures will be. So you, you're <laughs> you're not speculating on on the next big thing, but you're investing in in companies that are going to be sustainable, not a, only in an environmental sense, but also in a financial sense. In that they're uh, they're they're tracking on major themes that are going to be much more prevalent in our lives going forward. So that makes sense from um, a sustainable, both financial and and uh, environmentally. I think, Fantastic. And, and, and that's showing in in this uh, myriad amount of research showing that you you no longer have to sacrifice returns. It can be a little bit more expensive in terms of uh, the amount of it, it's it, it, the amount of active management in a in an ESG type of fund is typically going to be more. So they can be more expensive initially on each individual fund, but not much is getting better all the time. Thank you, Paul, for being part of this uh, this um, episode around uh, is there actually a need? Let's, uh, let's um, move on now to the next episode and we'll see you then. Okay. Thank you. Welcome back to this episode, Alexandra Brown. Thank you so much, Fraser, for having me. Now, thank you for being here. Now, uh, of course, we're talking about uh, the the hot topic of ESG and, and, and is it actually a thing and should it actually be a thing? So I'm sure you have plenty to say on this topic. I sure do. I sure do. I absolutely think it's a since I think it's a thing. So, you know, why ESG should be a part of financial advice? Why is it needed? You know, I think that this answer's got, it's definitely got many facets. Uh, if it's okay with you, though, the first one I'd like to discuss is this, that global need about, you know, uh, and why we should have this, because this also happens to be a big why for why I do this myself. So it's really important to me as well. This is my why for helping financial advisors get into this space, my why for helping them understand ESG and also to confidently provide ethical investment advice. And it all started probably a couple of years ago, I was reading some research on the sustainable development goals. And if you're not listening, not really familiar with the, the SDGs, you know, basically it's just 17 global goals that most countries in the world have agreed to try and meet by 2030. And the sustainable development goals around things like climate action and, and education for all and reducing poverty and, and life on land and, and water and things like that. So it's about these environmental and social challenges that we need to, to meet as, as a globe, <laughs> as a population, as a planet. So anyway, I don't know what the most recent figures are, but back in 2019, it was estimated that we need about $7.5 US trillion a year to meet these goals by 2030. And we were about 2.5 trillion US dollars a year short. Okay. So that's, a, that was a huge financing gap. And that was those figures, as I said, were back in 2019. So we're not going to meet these goals and targets by 2030. And I was reading this report and it had this really great diagram on it of the investment chain. So showing how money flows from people to the sustainable development goals. And if, uh, as you probably have seen it, the SDGs are depict, depicted as like this circular rainbow. So this rainbow ring was on the right and the people, the image of the people was on the left. And in the diagram between the SDGs and the people, it had all like the institutional investors and governments and corporations and uh, foundations and what have you. And basically it had arrows directing money from where the people were to the institutional investors and then to the sustainable development goals. And this was how we were going to hopefully meet these targets by mobilizing capital towards sustainability. But 
there was no mention of financial advisors. And, you know, you're, normally you would see them in the middle. Even if it says intermediaries or something, you would see something that mentions something between the people and the institutional investors. So, uh, you know, in my mind, a lot of people's money that's going through financial advisors before it even reach the, reaches these institutions. So I really felt like financial advisors were such an integral link in this investment chain and in getting money from the people to the SDGs. So, you know, my point is, you know, why is ESG a thing? Because globally, you know, we need it. We just need it. Amazing. Yeah, I, I love that. And I love a good infographic too, by the way. We should uh, try and source that and, and, and make that available in the show notes. So, uh, yeah, or even just redesign it and put a financial, uh, uh, you know, put, put a financial advisor in there and put somebody like yourself that teaches financial advisors in there. Just, just uh, you know, get that, get that conversation out there because it, it really does tell, you know, a picture tells a thousand words and a, and a good infographic like that can just sort of explain it all and, and, and a great reason why you're doing what you're doing, by the way. Thank you. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about the consumer behaviours uh, and what's driving. And I guess I guess let's start. We sort of talked to this about this last episode around you know consumer um, stats around consumer wants, and needs, and hopes and dreams and aspirations around this uh, that drives then um, that drives this conversation with advisors. Let's let's talk about how consumers are a big part of this. Yeah, absolutely. I honestly, I think that's, you know, the other biggest driver is client and consumer demand for ethical uh, investments and advice. And, uh, you know, the advice that takes into account ESG considerations. I do have a couple of stats for those that love their statistics like myself. Uh, so these two figures, they're taken from a 2020 consumer survey from RIA. And the first one states that 86% of Australians believe that it's important that their financial advisor asks them about their interests and values in relation to their investments. So 86% believe that their advisor should ask them. And the other one is that 88%, so nearly nine in 10 of Australians surveyed, believe it's important that their financial advisor provides responsible and ethical options. So that's the, those figures are, are just huge. Isn't that incredible? And I, in one of the episodes, we're going to talk about supply and demand. But um, like this is the this is the supply and demand equation, as we mentioned um, in the previous episode. Day, well, you mentioned in the previous episode just the the sheer short odds or the or the, or the lack of people that are actually specialising in the space or putting it out there and making getting the message out there that they specialise in the space compared to the demand. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Now, tell us what what's sort of driving that consumer behaviour. Is it um, are we looking at uh, you know activism, passions, um, you know, like human emotion, um, people really just taking more notice of the world around them, and, and the human rights is it media, uh, and how has the financial logic of financial returns sort of come into this? Um, where are we at at that space? Yeah, absolutely. I feel that it's all of the above <laughs> what you've been saying, you know, because we have so much information at our fingertips that this sharing of information has really enabled us to see the difference between, uh, you know, what our money can do and, and, and how we can invest better. And consumers are obviously part of that and, and seeing all that. So have you seen where where do you think we are in the way in the area of the financial um, returns from ethical investing stacking up with um, you know in it, there is a thing in the past and and maybe in the in our deep in our thinking that ethical investment funds never would return as good of returns as you know say those with, with that didn't take that into account honestly the performance myths have been busted so many times that I can't even believe that this is still a conversation. But, you know, people do want to see facts and figures and, and what have you. And go to the REAR website, go to the latest benchmark report. It's got a great table there showing, you know, eth responsible funds versus mainstream funds over one, three, five, and I think 10 year periods. And you'll see that the outperformance there of, of responsible and funds across pretty much all time periods. But I also think that it is a huge barrier in, in as far as uh, for advisors and even clients, uh, you know, understanding that you can achieve outperformance by investing more ethically. And I do actually have some more statistics because, you know, I just love a good statistic. Let's do it. 
Yeah, yeah. But so I I was reading the the Schroeder's Global Investor Study, which is from 2020, and they surveyed over 23,000 people across the globe. Okay, so it's a huge global study. And it showed that people around the world are increasingly becoming engaged with sustainable investing. They're increasingly willing to learn about the topic and become conscious investors. So um, it shows that, you know, people across the globe, they're just not only attracted to these sustainable investing approaches, um, but they also believe that this approach can lead to favorable investment outcomes, which I thought was, was great. So 42% expressed that the prospect of higher returns uh, was their reason for favoring sustainable investments. So 42%, it doesn't sound, you know, like a huge amount, you know, it's under 50%, but it is evidence to show that there are still many, uh, that many people do believe that you can uh, get higher returns with sustainable investing. But of course, there are still a lot of people that think that you have to sacrifice higher returns when choosing to invest sustainably. Yeah. And uh, I think I'll just uh, quickly contrast that with the, the study in Australia, which uh, was conducted by RIA as well. It showed that 67% of Australians believe ethical or responsible banks better uh, perform better in the long term. And 62% of Australians believe ethical or responsible super funds perform better in the long term. And these results, which was from 2019, were up 29% from 2017. So nearly a 30% jump in two years in how Australians are viewing the, the outperformance, I guess, of, of ethical investing. Yeah, wonderful. They, as you said, the, the performance myths have been busted and uh, and there's a couple of great resources there to, um, for, for advisors to be able to go and find that information. Uh, I do, um, I do you know, personally, I think the, the, the concept of past performance versus Future performance. We're talking about. Uh, we're talking about the. You know, skating to. Was it skating to where the puck is going to be? So uh, it, you know, it's not about. Um, it's not necessarily about past, but you, you're absolutely right. Hey, Alexandra, thank you so much for being on this uh, episode. I really appreciate it. I look forward to catching up with you again when we start chatting about the Fifty Shades of Green. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Fraser. James Howard, welcome back to this episode where we're talking about the actual need for ESG. Thanks, Fraser. Good to be back. Fantastic to have you back on. Now, tell us. Uh, let's let's get straight into it. Tell us about the uh, the actual need. Why why is there a need for ESG funds in the first place? Yeah, I think it's worth stepping back. You know, a couple of years and you know back to the bushfires. I think that that was really a what we saw as a defining moment for for this trend in ESG or the the huge flows of um, money that that we've seen going into ESG strategies. And you know, the bushfires really. Was a wake up call for a lot of uh, a lot of Australians to to understand that climate change is an issue. Um, we're seeing the same thing. I think in Greece this year we've had some um, some major fires over there, and you know California has 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 had some issues for a number of years now. So I think that's um, that's really woke up a lot of people that they want you know the the world to be a you know a good place for for their kids, their grandkids. Um, and you know, I think this is why you know ESG and particularly the environmental side of ESG has has been such a kind of key requirement for for investors. So in terms of why is it a thing, I think that that's that was really the the defining moment um, in terms of you know uh, resetting you know what what investors want from their investment products. So uh, that's 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 meant you know focusing you know, focusing on uh, carbon exposure and and really how. Companies are um, are addressing their their impact on the environment through their activities. So I think that's 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 a key thing that I would highlight. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? This is the world we uh, we all live in, uh, and our kids are going to grow up in. So it's uh, it's something that one that we want to leave in a better in, or in a decent place anyway. Um, so you sort of mentioned in the last episode that the governance has been around a long time, um, but this is really bringing the E out of the E S and G into it, isn't it? The environmental, you know, how do we want this world to live? Um, mm. Is this been a so? Has this been a client, uh, you know, a, a consumer client push then, or is it uh, is it is it coming from both ends? I think it's coming from from both sides. Um, yeah, the, there's there's also the regulatory side as well. So you know, the um, super funds have have requirements from APRA now to to consider climate change um, in the way they invest. Um, where some of the the other industry bodies like the the UN 
principles of responsible investing that that's been around for uh yeah over a decade but you know the the focus on climate change has has really ramped up and um you know as part of our submissions now we we need to to really um look at the you know the sensitivity and analysis of, of different climate scenarios and, and how that will affect our investment so you know it, it's it's evolving all the time. Uh, as I say, that's that's one of the, the great things about ESG that makes it so so interesting. Um, but it, it does remain hugely challenging as well. Um, you know, the, I, I read Bill Gates' book. I don't know whether um, uh, anybody on the the line has, but um, that's certainly a, worth a read. Just in terms of how we need to, you know, what we need to change to get to net zero by 2050. There's there's an enormous amount of um, change that, that will be needed to to get there. And and really, then that that comes back to your your question around governance. Um, the that um, you know, we we need to to influence companies to to change because you know. There's, there's probably not a immediate financial benefit from doing so. Um, I think that you know there will be a cost to um, to invest in new technologies. Um, great to see companies like Fortescue uh, making those investments and and really you know having that longer term forward perspective on you know on the world you know ten years down the line. Um, but you know definitely some of the industry bodies um, like investors groups on climate change. Um, that can that can really influence behaviors as well. So you know, governance is an important part of the uh, the solution. Yeah, it's, it seems to me that there's a lot of there's a lot involved for a company to make this to this decision to do that. Um, and obviously, you know, the early adopters are going to be able to. Well, we'll probably have to go through a little bit of pain, but also get the um, I guess the get get the coverage for it. Um, you know, for doing so and being that being named as the ones that are leading the way, leading the pathway. With consumer behavior, there's, a, you know, obviously with, uh, I think with, you know, social media and ways that, that so, you know, social, um, the word can get around, around the activism and, and, and passion and emotion um, can get pushed out pretty quickly and then spread pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm probably the, the wrong demographic in, in, in terms of, you know, the, the, the younger generation and what they're, you know, how they use um, you know, different social media platforms to, to influence behavior. But, um, yeah, I think, um, well, Maybe things like you know the the Rio Tinto junk and gorge um, controversy last year um, around the Aboriginal heritage site. You know that there's there's uh, if if companies get involved in those kinds of activities, um, they're going to going to be blasted by you know not just investors but by um, individual and consumers as well. Um, and and you know that had a, a massive impact in, in that you know, a lot of the board ended up losing their their jobs due to um, the governance from that as well. So I think there's, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of aspects to this. Um, without a doubt, I think, um, you know, younger investors are looking for, you know, typically more growthy types of assets as well. Um, you know, that, that, that they naturally tend to, 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 to investment, say like a lithium batteries and, 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 and that part of, um, the investment landscape. But um, yeah, it's definitely um, something that um, you know I think we see from from all angles, basically. Yep. It, and now, I guess in the past, I used to used to feel like there was the um, you know those people who are passionate and active uh, in within those companies, and then on the other end of the spectrum, there was people who were just chasing financial returns or the the logic behind you know getting better returns. Are we mm. seeing these two ends of the spectrum coming sort of closer together? Yeah, look, I, I think that's a great question. And, um, you know, when I started uh, really focusing on ESG maybe six, seven years ago, I think there was back then there was a, a belief that, you know, you went down the ESG route, you know, at the expense of returns. Um, I think that, that that whole aspect has turned on its head now that, that um, investors expect, you know, ESG investing to, to, to match or, or deliver better returns than um, you know, non ESG based investments. Um, that's, I think that, you know, clearly the jury's still out and, you know, um, a lot of this, you know, a lot of the, um, quantitative work that, that looks at that these strategies and how they perform through time, it's obviously looking backwards, but I think if we look forwards, um, you know, inc increasingly now that the expectation is for, for companies to do the right thing. Uh, I think I mentioned in the, the previous um, session that you know we're starting to see companies demerge. So um, you know Woolworths demerged their alcohol business to to 
to allow investors to to access you know Woolworths the supermarkets as a security um not having the alcohol business is you know has allowed other investors to do that and clearly the flow of money into those stocks is going to be beneficial as well so i think the the sin areas of the market are going to be harder and harder for more more and more people to invest in and uh, you know that's why um you know AGL is probably another example that, that's going through a you know AGL is our biggest emitter um from from all of its coal fired power generation but you know the company is looking to separate into a renewable um focus company and then the the kind of legacy old um coal fired power generating business as well so i think you know there is this natural trend to you know for companies to position their businesses you know for a sustainable future um and i think naturally that's that's where money will go and uh, you would expect you know as a result the you know those parts of the market to 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 to, to do well and um you know non ESG focused uh, areas to 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 increasingly struggle yeah, I feel like uh, consumers are, are making a bit more of a statement with their with their purchasing power, um, which is bringing the the ESG fund or business, the companies that are focusing on you know showing how how they how well they do in this space, especially with environmental and social issues, um, to then have more uh, custom. I guess people are spending more money with those companies, and therefore that's that'll help with the returns for the for the investors. Yeah, yeah. Look, and I, I, I think it really touches everything we do from a purchasing perspective. You know, if, if you if you buy a chocolate bar, you know, where does that cocoa come from? You know, has there been modern slavery involved in that? Has there been some deforestation? Um, I, I think increasingly you're going to find um, all consumer products have more and more disclosure on um, you know where you know where that supply is coming from. We've We've got so we've had some new regulation come into Australia this year on modern slavery. So um, you know we we have a, a modern slavery statement, and um, uh, it, it's it's an area that's you know quite complex in terms of supply chains, uh, and um, you know also the fact that we're based you know in, in the Asia region, that's where the the biggest area of modern slavery um, occurs in the world. So you know again. Investors don't want exposure to that clearly, um, but you know, trying to get that information is 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 not always easy. But I think you will start to to see more and more um, information disclosed on consumer products to to allow you know individuals when they're making purchases to to, to have them aligned with their values, basically. Yep, fantastic, James. Thanks for coming on uh, this episode and talking about the actual need for ESG. Uh, We look forward to catching you in the next episode where we dive a bit deeper into the 50 Shades of Green. Thanks, Fraser.